All right, um, now we're looking at ionic compounds and ionic bonding. So this is um, first part of it is obviously looking at the structure of ionic compounds and how that relates to the properties that ionic compounds have. This subtitle, why is salt brittle? So why does salt crack when you kind of smash it apart? Now salt, as you know, um, is an ionic compound. So let's go have a look at these things anyway. Part of this might be a revision from last year. You might already know it. But as I said, this is a materials section. So material science is what we're looking at. And this will look at how the properties of a material directly relate to its structure. And we've done metallic bonding already. We're looking at ionic now. And the next one is covalent. So keep stay tuned for that later on. But ionic, that's where it's at right now. So what are ionic compounds? Ionic compounds are formed when metals and non-metals bond together. So they're formed um, when a metal and non-metal get together and kind of form a form an ionic bond. Salt is an ionic compound because you have a, a metal being sodium and a non-metal being chlorine. Properties kind of can be linked back to salt if you think about it. Salt is a very strong molecule. Okay, salt is actually quite hard. Um, if you've ever kind of um, gotten salt and you rub it in your hands, it actually can be act like a sandpaper type thing. It's actually quite a strong molecule. However, salt is brittle. Brittle meaning it doesn't bend. Things can be strong and brittle at the same time. Okay, so strong because it's a hard molecule and brittle because it snaps, it doesn't bend. It's got a very high melting point. Um, if you kind of, I think it's about 800 degrees, give or take. I can't remember exactly what it is. I should have actually Googled that beforehand. But I think it's about 800 degrees, which is a very high melting point. It doesn't conduct electricity when it's a solid. So if you get a crystal of salt, um, try and make electricity flow through it, it won't happen. However, when you dissolve it in some water, what you'll notice is it does actually conduct electricity when it's dissolved. And if you melt it down, if you get it up to that degrees, um, the um, temperature at which it melts, it will actually conduct electricity when it's a liquid, so when it's molten. So they're the properties of ionic compounds. All ionic compounds have these properties. They're all strong, they're all brittle, they all have melting points which are quite high. They don't conduct electricity as a solid, but they do conduct electricity when they're dissolved or when they're a liquid in the molten state. Let's have a look quickly at how ionic compounds form and then we'll look at the structure and how these properties can be explained. So this might be a bit from last year as well, but we're going to look at um, the ionic bonding model and how it all works. We've got sodium and chlorine as our um, two molecules. Obviously, I kind of like to use salt because it's a, it's a common um, molecule, it's a common um, compound, sorry, which you can use. So. Sodium is like this as the Lewis dot structure. It has one electron on the outside shell. Chlorine has seven electrons here on the outside shell. Now, how are these two things going to bond together? We know that um, metals lose electrons to become stable and non-metals gain electrons to become stable. So what sodium is going to do, it's just going to lose this one electron and this chlorine over here is going to gain the one electron to form eight on its outside shell and that's going to make it stable. So what's going to happen? This guy is going to come over here and he's going to lose his electron and he's going to gain one electron. And he wants to gain it to become stable with an octet. The octet rule being that they have eight electrons on their outside shell. So we end up with sodium here and chlorine. Um, this should be actually sodium plus here because it's lost that electron. I haven't written it in. So if you have these notes, please write in your plus sign here for sodium. We have sodium plus because it's lost an electron and chlorine negative because it's gained the negative electron. This forms sodium chloride where we have an interaction between this positively charged sodium and this negatively charged chlorine and we are, they're bonding together, they're pulling each other close together. This diagram here of showing where the electrons are going is known as an electron transfer diagram. You're going to need to understand how to draw these. And you draw them just as I have, with your Lewis dot structures and an arrow showing where the electrons are being transferred to. Ionic compounds, um, basically, they're not molecules as such because they kind of repeat on. What they're known as are formula units. So this is a formula unit 
for um, sodium chloride. It's kind of like the empirical formula of the sodium chloride compound. So you have every one sodium has one chlorine attached to it because you need one of each here to make it stable there. So that's um, how they form. That's the electron transfer diagrams where we have the electron transferring from the sodium, from the metal, to the chlorine. And you're showing um, the sodium plus here and you're showing the chlorine negative here. Let's move on and look at the actual bonding model. So here's the bonding model here. We have sodium chlorine, sodium chloride. We have the sodiums being the positive and the chlorine being the negative. What happens is these actually line up as positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, so on and so forth, like that. And they're really strong interaction. They are strong and they have a very high melting point for a similar reason that metals also have a, a strong and normally have a high melting point. This is due to the strong electrostatic forces between the cations and the anions. So the force between this positive charge here and this negative charge here is very strong. Okay, So what's happening is this strong force makes it very hard to break these two things apart. So being strong and having a high melting point is due to the strong electrostatic force between cations and anions. Remember, cations are your positive, anions are your negative ions. Okay? And just imagine this as being 3D as well. Always remember um, your bonding models are always three dimensional. So behind this positive cation here, you'd have a negative anion there. Behind this negative anion here, you'd have a positive cation here. So imagine this as being a 3D model. I haven't drawn it very 3D, but obviously you can use your brains and kind of visualize that yourselves. But that's the first property that we've explained, being strong and having a high melting point. Let's move on to the next part. Okay, Sodium chloride or salt does not conduct electricity as a solid. This is because these particles, when it's a solid, they're kind of locked in place and cannot move. So because these particles, the, the positive cation and the negative anion, are locked there, they're kind of joined together, they're held there by the strong electrostatic force, they can't move. So what mean, that means is they can't carry a charge from one side to the next. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, So the reason things can't conduct electricity is because we have no moving charged particles. The cations and the anions are locked in place when it's a solid. Okay. When it's a liquid, when it's molten or dissolved, however, what happens is we get this happening where they're all kind of free to move around. As soon as you melt it down, these particles are free to move around. Okay. You can see them kind of moving around here when they're dissolved. What this allows to happen is allows the positive charge, or sorry, sorry, allows the negative charge, that is electricity, to pass through it. What will happen is the charge will come onto one side of it and then be taken with it through using these free-moving charged particles. And the free-moving charged particles in the ionic bonding model are your anions and your cations. This is different to metallic bonding. Remember, metallic bonding, you had delocalized electrons. In ionic bonding, however, you don't have any delocalized electrons. What you have is cations and anions. So sodium chloride or ionic um, compounds in general can conduct electricity when dissolved or in the molten state because the charged particles are free to move and carry the charge with them. So that's what's happening in the ionic bonding model. The last one is looking at why these ionic bonding um, ionic compounds are brittle. And this is probably my favorite one of all. Now, what you can imagine here is um, the oppositely charged particles here are lined up. So you have your negative and your positive here. However, if you um, push this down, what you can see is that the two things here, your two positively charged things, kind of line up together. So when you're bending it, what you're doing is pushing one of these lines down. 
and that makes these same charges line up and what happens there is they repel each other. So they all start to repel each other and it will snap off and become brittle. Okay, so that's why ionic compounds are brittle because when you um, push them on them, when you move them down, the same charges, like charges, line up, not oppositely charged particles. Oh, this is a little bit wrong. Oppositely charged particles are meant to say same particles, same charge, so the positive and the positive lined up, and they repel each other, and thus the lattice shatters. So change this oppositely charged to the same charge or similarly charged particles. They line up, and that's why your lattice shatters. And that's the ionic bottom bottle. Um, that's explained your different properties. And if you don't understand this, please go back to the start of the video, watch it again, and hopefully things will kind of come, um, come with time. And if you still don't understand it, please send me an email or see me in class. The next thing we're going to look at is how we actually write ionic compound formulas and name them as well. And that's going to be in the second podcast for ionic compounds. So that was just the bonding model um, where you have the positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, where we have the cation and the anion. The next one is going to be actually looking at naming and writing the formulas. You should now, however, be able to explain all the properties using this bonding model here and using little diagrams. Stay tuned for the next podcast, which will be on, as I said, ionic compound formulas and names. Thank you.